Hello, my name's Toby Haydock and this is Happy Times and Places, in which I ask a friend of mine to choose a Doctor Who story and to nominate their favourite things about it. I have to watch each episode and commentate along, accentuating the positive and seeing if I can try to guess that favourite thing. Hello, my name is Jeremy Bentham. Well, I'm one of the, what Doctor Who magazine likes to call one of the last of the few who were actually still around to watch the original stories of Doctor Who from the very beginning. I'm very pleased to nominate as my Doctor Who story for Toby's uh, Enterprise, Marco Polo. Well, welcome everybody to what I think is going to be one of the more testing assignments for Happy Times and Places. Although I would like to just uh, redraw your attention to the introduction you just heard by Jeremy Bentham. That was a cut down version to listen to the whole thing. Uh, Do go back to episode one where he gives a lovely five minute intro. Uh, I think he's going to be a very erudite customer, which is great, which is one of the reasons uh, I asked him to do it. The other is because he is a fan of your and I have great respect for those people that were there in the early days of fandom showing us how it was done, tracking down a lot of those people that, uh, you know, were gone by the time that we were doing what we're doing now with the DVDs and Blu-rays and getting those people on record. And in Jeremy's case, you know, um, didn't even, you know, mention the envisions and, the, and, and, and yeah, the sort of really sort of scholastic uh, and professional approach to um, chronicling, you know, the early years of Doctor Who. Uh yeah, as I say, they sort of showed us how it was done, how to do it. Uh, so I have a lot of respect for Jeremy. Um, and I, and he, and he said, uh, he said, I'll, I'll see you, mate, at the end of the last episode, and that that gave me a little frisson um, of. Um, I was, I felt a little bit proud of that, um, because uh, I'm still a little boy in the countryside, uh, poring over Doctor Who, the early years, and all of that. Uh, that fascinating stuff. It was a window into a, a, a universe, finding out the behind the scenes stuff or the history of Doctor Who. And it was a window opened by Jeremy and his ilk. Um, I mean, it was my lifeline outside in the country in the middle of nowhere, the youngest of four, the others, you know, a bit of a gap, uh, mum on her own. So I was pretty much left to my own devices and I needed an escape. And I escaped through that window into the the past of Doctor Who and behind the scenes of Doctor Who. Oh, and, uh, uh, and, and part of me has always stayed there. <laughs> so uh, I'm grateful to Jeremy. I'm grateful to you for listening to this. And I hope for, for many of you, this is a journey, um, uh, you know, to Cathay that uh, you've probably taken uh, as infrequently as I, because it's one of the sort of least available, really, of the, of the stories, just in the sense that there's... You know, yeah, there's the uh, the CD with narration and uh, recons if you can find them. But, um, oh, and a cut-down version isn't there commercially available on the beginning box set. But um, I think one of the interesting sort of strengths of Marco Polo is the fact that it decides that it's a, it's a long story. It's a seven-part epic. Let's see if there's any padding. Let's see if it uh, could afford to uh, lose a few pounds. Uh, I'll tell you what would help you to lose a few pounds is trekking across the desert on foot uh so let's see what happens uh, uh as we play the tune of the singing sands and i'm gonna press play in three two one um and it's i'm i'm not watching this on my telly because it's not obviously available on on the telly uh, and uh, I don't have subtitles, unfortunately, so um, where I might sometimes be able to pick out bits of uh, dialogue without shutting up. Uh, this is a slightly different prospect, but we open with a different actor playing Man at Lop. I love this stuff because uh, Leslie Bates, although they did actually refilm the scene because what they used to sometimes do is last week they'd... Uh, they'd refilm the cliffhanger in order to play it in and be able to play the the titles over it because obviously last week it had the title next week uh over it so they do they do it twice sometimes they would uh just play it in that the one that they had from last week in 
um, but there's an episode of the Daleks where you can tell it's the one where they find out about the fl- the, f- the fluid link that they've left in the city. You know, the, the recap we see next week is different from the episode ending, but it was recorded last week because then they didn't have to build the set again and all of that sort of thing. But sometimes, so so what they did was they refilmed that uh, with Leslie ba- uh, Leslie Bates as Man at Lot in order to play it in. But then obviously they realised that they might have to pay Leslie Bates to use him again. Um, that may have been the reason. I'm assuming that's the reason because um, th- you you know the rules on those sorts of things were quite tough in those days. Not so much these days where you quite often see actors. Uh, in in new footage where they're not speaking in an episode or something and they don't even get a credit these days or um uh, or, or sometimes a a character is not played by an actor even though they've got dialogue because they're sort of shot over the shoulder and then dubbed in ADR by somebody else so then uh, you're not having to, because it's a different kind of contract um the shoulder actor and the vocal actor aren't on the same sort of residuals they would be if they were an actor actually hired to play a part and be on set and blah blah blah. So there's lots of ways that sort of small parts are cheated these days. Whereas then, um, yeah, instead of paying Leslie Bates to come back next week, there's a shot over the shoulder. His character doesn't have a line and, uh, 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 and he's played by somebody else. Um, Either Arnold Lee or John Lee, which led to... I've seen stuff even recently suggesting that it's John Lee who played Alidon in The Daleks. You know, main guest star two weeks ago, suddenly being a a Chinese extra, what, three weeks later. No, it's not. It's that... Just like Arnold Lee is called Arnold Lee, there was lots of non-speaking actors with uh, uh, surnames of Asian... uh, 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 East Asian provenance... uh, and uh, so, so John Lee and people go, oh, but you can't have two actors with the same name. I suspect the John Lee, who's a, an extra in this, wasn't a member of Equity um, because they would have had a smaller pool uh, of, of people to, uh, to use. So I can say 100% it's not Alidon coming back <laughs> three weeks later, his career having suddenly plummeted. But that hasn't stopped it appearing in various uh, organs and... St- places online anyway doesn't matter toby these things do not matter they matter to you and nobody else but you'll see something that's wrong and you have to correct it which is why you then can't get annoyed when people correct you when you've done things wrong but you do don't you well you don't you just go oh come on you've listened to that thing that's now long and you've picked me up on my pronunciation of that or said i've missed out that come on could you have said something else first uh anyway <laughs> let's not have a monologue about let's let's not let's not, let's not uh exorcise my in the monologue because let's talk about the brilliance of marco polo he looked great i think uh uh tigana played by Darren nesbitt and i like the sort of chess um metaphor that they that they have in that dialogue exchange um this external set looks quite nice and the lighting because it's night time and you can hear the wind i i do worry that this might be an episode where the visuals might be slightly compromised because I think the sandstorm was done a bit like the snow was done in uh, the Seeds of Doom where it's a sort of an electronic sort of overlay um, over the picture which always looks a bit phony Um, but uh, ah, and of course this scene with Barbara and Susan, I love the lighting on it. I can't choose the lighting. Jeremy chose that last week. I mean, I like the fact they're in sort of night gear and slightly darker clothes. It just seems because of the length of this and the costume changes, and you and you and you, and you feel that they're with Marco's caravan for a long time, and they you know they sleep over and they travel for months, don't they? I, I love the feeling of this. It's quite unlike almost any other Doctor Who story in that it's it's quite happy to show us taking a, a, a you, you know, the travelers taking a long time doing this i like this scene um but it was originally i think this was a scene between doctor who and susan foreman but where is doctor who this week you think oh hartnell's on holiday no he's not he turns up at the end uh and it's that beautiful um thing because we we get quite used to it don't we We're watching 62 now when a regular's not in it for, for for a week but that's not what this is hartnell was ill because uh, there's a, I think there's a letter saying hope you get better soon. So I think he must have only come in for the for the Friday and the Saturday. Uh, sorry, the maybe the Friday's recording. Um, 
uh, no, the Saturday recording, whenever it was they recorded it, um, and perhaps the camera rehearsal the day before. But he basically had the week off and came in to come and do his one scene that he does at pretty much the end of the episode. So they could sort of do without him all week because he wasn't feeling very well. Um, and they had to go, OK, well, we've got to rewrite the scripts. Um, fortunately, he wasn't in it that much anyway. But um, it, it means that, you know, they're making the show on the fly. And, of course, you know, it's... I, I remember in um, Doctor Who A Celebration, it was J- Jeremy Bentham, of course, wrote about, um, I think, in his in his write-up of one of the stories t- talks about, you know, when the regulars have time off. And Susan, has, Susan Caroline Ford has a couple of episodes of uh, the Aztecs off, but she's there because she's on film. Uh, ditto William Russell in The Reign of Terror. He pre-films his contributions to a couple of the middle episodes. Jacqueline Hill actually isn't in uh, a couple of the episodes of The Censor Rights. And William Hartnell, and it said, as it says in Doctor Who's Adoration, in a move that would be unthinkable today, is completely absent from Keys of Marinus uh, 3 and 4. And that is kind of completely unthinkable today, except, of course, today we then got used to the Doctor Light episodes like uh, like Blink and uh, uh, and Turn Left and, and things like that. So suddenly, a thing that seemed like a relic of the old days that schedules meant that we had to lose our leading actor meant you did suddenly get dr light episodes which suddenly started to remind you of things like star trek the next generation where captain picard you know wasn't in the episode much because it was a dr crusher episode but you go yeah yeah but you wouldn't do that with doctor who because it's it's doctor who and then of course you learn about the 60s and you go actually there were loads of episodes that hardly had doctor who in because although they never were quite as blatant as as with keys of mariners three and four i mean in things like the, the time meddler two you know he's in the beginning of the episode or he's a voiceover um ditto the massacre episode he's he's pre-filmed so that they don't really after um keys of marinus um ever go well we can do without the doctor for two episodes they they at least try and sort of cover it up artfully um but here it's not that's not what this is here um yeah on the fly they have they've suddenly lost their leading actor for most of the week's rehearsals um and they just they just adapt um and i don't think i don't think the story loses anything because of it which is interesting because it is you know the show is called doctor who and the doctor is the main character and yet he's the first regular to to sort of disappear from an episode um but it's it's a testament to the strength of actually not only william russell Jacqueline Hill and Caroline Ford, but actually Mark Eden and and Darren Nesbitt and Xenia Merton, who already, I think, this story feels like it has its sort of new set of regulars. They already, they, they feel like an ensemble. They're all on this journey together. Um, and this, this, this sort of bond of sort of respectful mistrust that Ian and Marco have between them is, is, is not like a, a, a guest character in a regular, uh, fe, you know, fe, facing off it's it's more like sort of sort of two 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 heroes in their own series with their own slightly different agendas and that's i think partially because mark uh, mark eden is is very good but also because he's very dashing he's a good looking leading man um he's got he's got exactly the right presence um and susan and ping cho are having a little adventure and i love that um it, it's odd i, I, lo- I love caroline ford when she's the alien mysterious susan but here she gets to be the sort of slightly girly teenagey susan and that kind of works uh, as well it's only when she has to be scared of shrubbery that there's a problem with susan i think which has to trip over um but but having a mate in this i think i think there's a really lovely ensemble feel uh that that as i say that stretches to the guest cast beyond the regulars and again i think here in this episode there's only three credited guest actors and it's it's marco tigana and ping cho uh, which for a story, again, that you think of as being an, an epic, a populated epic, um, is, a, is, a, is a nice little sort of sleight of hand. It makes you think it's a bigger story than, and because it gets big later on, than it, than it actually is. Now, whether that would have had that effect on the audience, because, of course, they don't, they don't know the story as a whole, whereas a, when I came to it, you know, I, I, I came to it with the knowledge it was seven parts long and it had quite a big cast, so... That's obviously, I'm very much looking looking back on that idea. 
but that's okay. I can only take as I find. Uh, this is beautiful nighttime stuff, and it will have been done on a very simple, small set. Um, and as I say, with the sort of electronic uh, overlay. But I love that. It's a very poetic idea again, isn't it, about the singing sands and all the dialogue about them and the, you know, like sirens luring people uh, to their to their deaths is 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 really sort of poetic and interesting stuff. Um, I li I like the sort of lyricism uh, of John Lucarotti scripts where you know uh, 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 a, a, a chess match is is more than actual chess match. Um, you know, dangerous sandstorm is slightly more than that. It's it's not. It's the echoes of the gods. It's the sounds of the you know. It's it's it's. It, it it has a it has a presence and a role and a backstory, or or, or 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 there's discussion about it within the drama that takes it beyond what it just the the, the one thing that it is on on screen a chess match or a sandstorm or whatever and I, and that's good writing that's you know that's everything having a purpose beyond its primary purpose unlike a drama where you know where people basically you know say what they think and it does exactly what it says on the tin uh, that, that, that's you know that's 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 level one writing if you like um uh and yeah i remember i remember the being a doctor who archive of uh of of this in Doctor Who magazine, I remember that and it was it was uh, had a repeat illustration of uh, of sort of Tigana at the at the at the end of this episode with the with the water gourd, um, you know, proffering it to the skies. Here's water, Marco Polo, come for it, and and thinking that just seemed like uh, I love that sort of piece of taunting that he does, um, and and I was you know amazed that they'd got that photo, and then I was I've been ama constantly amazed at how many photos they have of this production without having the thing itself, and yet a lot of this is quite unfamiliar to me because. I've 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 seen the pictures, but I've not uh, I've not experienced the action so much. And of course, this is this is all quite difficult to discern because it's, um, but I uh, because it's because it's action, um, but but I but but the the sound the soundscape is very effective because it's it, again it it's been set up as this idea that, um. You can't trust your ears because within the sandstorm, the sounds refract in different ways. And so, um, uh, you know, pe yeah, people are lured to their deaths or whatever. So um, but of course, we know that this is this is Ian uh, calling out to uh, to Susan and Pincho. And of course, oh, yes. And, and, and Tigana appears over the hill. And that was pre shot on film um, over Tigana appearing over the sand dune. Um, so he comes and rescues them. Interestingly, after my monologue last week, uh, which I hope wasn't ill-advised, um, I hope not. I hope not. Um, uh, there's been a report about uh, an Italian opera, um, which in 2022 has used blackface. And you go, that is absolutely ridiculous and appalling. And there's no excuse for that. Uh, and having spent last week, we, last episode, me scolding modern people, going, D "There's no point telling off an old television program or, or getting or, or, or getting on your high horse about morals you can't possibly quantify or understand uh, with, without the context." And context is important. Um, and no, Warris is saying probably isn't a racist. Um, uh, and and the dispensation of that sort of criticism, which is. Uh, all too quickly thrown out by, uh, yeah, I'm not going to sound old now, young people today. Oh, I, I talked about all that last week. I, there's then that report comes out and you get loads of people, probably of my age, going, well, nothing wrong with that. Should just be the right person for the job. And you think, well, if you think the right person for the job of playing a black character in a play is somebody that isn't a black person, then what are you saying? That all of the black actors that could have done that wouldn't be good enough actors? Actors? What what does that say? Um, or, or opera singers or whatever? Um, I, 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 you know, I, I and, and 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 so you know, my my uh, the opprobrium I doled out 
last week to one side of the argument is 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 thrown into sharp contrast and a healthy reminder that the reason that um uh particularly um young people are so all over this sort of stuff is because it's it's it casts a long shadow and it and it comes from a place of genuine concern and there are people um for whom the idea of 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 um you know blacking up and yellow face now would be perfectly acceptable which i find absolutely baffling uh so but isn't it interesting that i'm uh, and, and obviously i i hate racism more than i hate anti-racism and yet my back is still put up by the propensity of 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 you know fellow liberals to scold um but that's partially maybe because I'm an older person and I've got two young sons who who will occasionally scold me and that makes me feel very defensive. So maybe when I see people doing a bit of scolding, I'm I'm reacting to my own automatic reaction. So it's always worth it's always worth being aware of where you yourself are coming from and and being prepared to go, well, uh, you know, there's a reason I react the way that I do. Uh, But yes. So. Um, that was a timely reminder that whilst it must, it might be annoying to me that, um, as I say, uh, I think we should be able to talk about these stories made at this time without always having to uh, raise the spectre of, of different um, standards of representation um, and and actually, you know, what was practically uh, available to people at the time because it gets a bit boring. And also, I, don't, I just don't know what people, you know. Uh, uh, but anyway... But beyond that, there's also a reason why uh, we we have to be alert to that sort of stuff because actually regressive steps are, are, are not necessarily as far away as we might think. So there we go. I, I think it's boring that I have to talk about all that stuff. And I don't have to talk about all that stuff. I could talk about whatever I want. Uh, but um, it is something that... It is something that makes me... Th- think and consider and I think one should always be aware of one's own potential to be wrong Um, but also I'm slightly defensive because I'm aware that this is something that goes out and people listen to and if somebody wanted to with um, ill grace or um, or or assuming the worst you know twist the nuance i'm trying to bring to these arguments to say toby hayden thinks that yellow face is all right he's another racist and, you know, so um i suppose that's where that comes from uh anyway interesting um i like darren nesbitt's performance i think i think his his you know again again you wouldn't you wouldn't cast him today but uh f- from what we had in and i and actually Warris is saying or whoever whomever um filling the background uh with with genuinely uh you know with 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 with, with non made up actors um or non act you know supporting artists uh is uh, means means at least the 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 sort of crowd scenes are, are <laughs> would will be would be would be less offensive than they potentially could have been. Um, uh, it would. It, I, 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 I mean, Barry Newbury was a, was a great designer, but we know that external scenes set uh, set within a BBC studio um, are always a little bit of a compromise. But these this stuff inside the tents looks. Uh, looks absolutely amazing uh and there's zora seagal at the back she comes back in the crusade she's not credited in this um but uh as as uh as ping cho's sort of assistant lady she lived to be 102 uh and was a an experienced uh movie actress by the end of her time but she also she also uh gave Xenia Merton a, a bit of coaching for a special moment that comes up uh, in the next episode. But uh, yeah, she uh, I think she lived to be about 102, uh, a heroine of the uh, of the big big and small screen. Uh, 
so the doctor hasn't been in it yet uh and but this is this is a, a, an, another of those examples of a lot of the drama is coming from the environment now it's it's being slightly twisted by the machinations of tigana but that's what makes him rather a good villain is that he's um he's he's sort of beavering away behind the scenes to turn what is available to him to his advantage so the fact that it's hot he's like well if they don't have any water and that'll go and and and, and prior to that we've had we've had the sands you know the sandstorm which there's nothing supernatural about it at all but because it's set in the past and because there is legend about the noise that it that, that 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 it makes that gives it a kind of supernatural feel so the story has its cake and eats it in that way is it invokes the supernatural but 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 gives it a rational explanation um so you could be scary and believable which is great and also something that has uh, a, a legend attached to it is always just a little bit spookier because legends are evocative of of the past and this is the past itself already but if if people in the past are talking about legends and you know that because because we're detached from those people because because you know the people that spun legends by the time that we read them are, are all long dead themselves that gives it uh, a, a special kind of haunting quality because anything that, that from folklore or whatever is by its nature got an extra spooky dimension because yeah f f folklore is established by people themselves now long dead um so we've had the sands and now we've got the water um which which again you uh, very possible in these early days for for just just to come to a place and the place itself be the danger uh, and and the 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 distance from the TARDIS in in this it's actually not distance of proximity but uh, but of but of story but of, of of character you know Marco has separated the the characters from the TARDIS um, uh, becomes becomes as much of a danger as you know a, a city full of machine creatures or whatever you know the 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 dangers here are no different really to those in the in the uh, you know, in the jungle around the Daleks, except there's no tentacled monster to drag you underwater, but there is, you know, a dry desert to uh, dehydrate you and, uh, you know, a, a, a terrifying sandstorm to, to cut you to pieces. Uh, and here we have Doctor Who, finally, in this episode. This episode, when I was younger, was actually rumoured to exist. Now, there's been a, there's a couple. There's, 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 there's the rumour, of course, about parts one and two, still being in iran somebody's followed a paper trail and said uh, uh you know it, it may be that uh, that, that uh, one and two ended up in iran and, and never came back and but the, some you know th three to seven something else happened to them but there was also a room when i was younger D dwb and and you know various publications ran ran missing episode rumors quite regularly i remember the highlanders two and four was one that was uh that was 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 a, was a pair of episodes that were that were rumored to be flying about um but but for some reason the singing sands somebody had said the singing sands was about and it seemed quite sort of plausible to go what just one episode of marco polo has turned up well yeah, why wouldn't it um uh so for ages it was one of those ones i sort of assumed was out there somewhere and it's only when you think about it 30 years later you go that's no more or less likely than any other episode and that rumor could have sprung from anything or anyone um, I mean, in my time, I've probably heard of rumours of almost every single um, episode of Doctor Who existing somewhere, except bizarrely, probably Galaxy Four, Episode Three, and the Underwater Menace, Episode Two, which were the, 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 the ones that did turn up pretty much the most recently. <laughs> no, they they turned up before um, Web and Enemy, didn't they? But uh, um, I've still still got some great hat action going on. Um, I mean, they do look like lampshades, don't they? Um, it's a nice looking set, this with the exterior of the caravan and uh, and they seem to be suggesting the heat quite nicely with the sort of, you know, Ian's open shirt. And, but I don't think enough has been talked about the hats of Marco Polo because I'm seeing some pretty good hat action. The, and, and a lot of these hats aren't in the pictures, thanks to the telesnaps. Uh, I, I think I'm much more aware of the the lampshade hats he's got a wonderful voice hasn't he mark eden um 
And he was a beast in Coronation Street. Uh, but uh, I know that, uh, you know, Warris is saying cast him because he was so handsome. Oh, yeah, without water, the doctor's not going to last for 24 hours. <sighs> Yeah, and I and and I love the way these two sort of take each other to to one side to sort of weigh up the different aspects of the drama. Um, and here we have the the famous scene of, uh, and this is brilliant because I love it because because we all know what it's like to be parched, uh, and this is you know parched turned up to eleven because he's been you know in the desert and and we and we know that our heroes are there licking their dried, cracked, arid lips uh, as this guy you know drinks deep and then that's such a cruel thing to do and you know it's not a traditional episode ending by any stretch of the imagination but it's a it's a really effective one uh because yeah um it's it's a it's a it's a more subtle and sort of characterful way of of sort of saying they're doomed uh you know more traditional would be to have you know everybody lying in the sun going if we don't get water soon we shall die i think it's it's much to then have to see the villain sort of taunting uh, our heroes even though they can't hear him i i think is uh, i think is a is a nice piece of writing it's a, he's a very good writer john lucarotti it's uh, i i i think he um i i i think there's a there's an there's an intelligence and a lyricism and a and a and a and, a, and, a, and a, a, a gift for character, but also all that stuff I talked about about um, things meaning more than just what they do dramatically. So there we are. I'm sorry I went into another segue about um, um, you can you can you can you can you know like, it's just like you can date seventies Doctor Who from. Uh, uh, the you know it's propensity to have dodgy CSO. You can probably date uh, uh, Doctor Who discourse to the twenty uh, twenties by uh, having um, uh, a, a stuttering middle aged guy trying to address the culture wars either in as uh, uh, apologetic and liberal a way as he can. Hello, that's me. Or or doubling down and being being awful as we as we see all too often on on social media so um i just think everybody should be nice to each other but i also think uh, i'm uh, as i say sc scolding i don't think looks good especially from the young i mean the, sorry the young but you don't know how to do things <laughs> um, but um sc scolding uh, and it's, and and i think again d wasting your time sort of wagging your finger at at uh something morality from from 50 years ago is is a is 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 a bit like telling them off for not being able to to use a microwave um uh, i think i think i've used that i think i may have used that analogy last week anyway let's not go any further with that um but as i say the reason I addressed it again this week is because there's been a reminder for all my reticence about the the scolding. Um, things do still happen in this day and age that show that we haven't perhaps made the progress that people like me might think we've made because I I see the progress that we have made and I may be because I'm a you know middle aged white guy I'm I'm blind to uh, things that are still happening that 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 and I'm aware that there are still changes that need to be made and progress that needs to be made so i am a, a, aware of that but perhaps there are some areas where that happens where i where i don't notice and i've got to be i've got to be cognizant of that because uh you must should never rest on your laurels and you should never think you know it all um i tend to go into most situations thinking i don't I, i'm probably wrong that's the other thing i think there's a lot of certainty about my kids certainly you know they're, they're very sure of uh, of their morality whereas uh whereas um and I, and I find that a lot in when when i you know when i have discourse with with uh with younger people i'm sounding like such an old fart aren't i but there's a real sort of certainty whereas i don't know if it's as you get older or no because i think i've always been you, you know I'm, I'm i've always got one eye on the fact that i could be totally wrong so 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 you know hedge your bets a little bit but 
that might be then me being a little bit mealy mouthed and just wanting to please everybody and actually real progress is made by people who are sure of themselves and who do crusade so ah it's difficult and it's interesting and it's got sod all to do with Doctor Who and probably everybody who's listened to this is really disappointed and I'm sorry uh, <laughs> I will talk about Margaret let's, let's make up for it by handing over to a very interesting guest who is Jeremy Bentham, who's going to tell us what his fate... Oh, I haven't chosen... Well, it's good because I have to download his uh, his video, actually. Uh, I have to choose uh, my favourite thing about episode two. Well, I like the fact that the environment itself is, is the danger. I like the fact that the guest characters already feel like part of an ensemble sort of cast and 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 and, and this whole world is is the only world that we're in i think that's really in, you know we're we're you know we're two two weeks ago they were you know wielding scissors to each other and talking as though they they were slightly drunk um uh, to, as as some stock music uh, echoed around the tardis uh, and now we're in you know the the, the gobi desert or wherever um, with with a new group of friends slash enemies, um, I also like the chess match and all of that sort of stuff, and the fact that John Lucarotti's got his eye on on subtext. But I think what I really like about this episode, I think what really speaks to me about this episode, is the fact that William Hartnell isn't in it yet. He sort of is. It's almost. It's it's. I think it is unique in the show's history, really, in, in, in that he's not had a week off. Um, and he is actually in the episode, except he wasn't there sort of when it was being made and and comes in for that final scene. And that wasn't the original plan and it was a last minute expedient. And as a result, the production has to jiggle about a little bit and sort itself out. And yet it's still a really good and entertaining episode of Doctor Who. Uh, and and there's it's a sort of almost production sleight of hand. Um, and, and obviously that informs a modern audience in a slightly different way because we know that William Hartnell sometimes had a week off and so you might be watching it and thinking oh is he having one of his oh no he's not except of course uh, <coughs> uh, that that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't um, have, have been the impact at the time because people weren't as um, you know savvy of such things and actually the show was in its infancy so um, but I do I am I do I am I going to choose Hartnell's absence and the fact that they and well I think Hartnell's absence touches on so many things it touches on the fact that the show has such a strong core ensemble and that uh, William Russell is such a great sort of de facto leading man when he needs to be but it also speaks to that stuff about the world that's been created and the fact that you know Marco Polo himself has as much dramatic weight as as, as any of the regulars and what, what we've known him a week um it also speaks to the production and what the team had to do and how this show was made and how everybody just had to adapt and get on with it and do something a bit different uh, uh, because suddenly the leading man is taken ill. Um, so, yeah, because of because of the little ripple effects it has to every sort of part of the production and that are all positives, bred from a, a negative, our leading actor isn't available. I'm going to point to, yes... The absence of Hartnell and all the things that it creates. Uh, not because, and this is not because William Hartnell is not good or brilliant or wonderful. He is all of those things. Um, b and yet in spite of that, his absence also creates stuff that are good and brilliant and wonderful. And I like that scene between Barbara and Susan that wouldn't have happened uh had it not been for the fact that the guy that was originally supposed to be in it is uh in his, is in his cottage in mayfield surrey i think was it don't write in right uh let's see what jeremy bentham says uh i'm loving jeremy bentham's contributions by the way for the singing sounds best aspect of the singing sounds i've chosen sound design uh something which Doctor Who as a series was tremendously accomplished in achieving, particularly during the 1960s. Now, special sound isn't just uh, the music that would have been supplied by the composer Tristram Carey. We're also talking here about the special sounds, the, uh, the 
a special effects stock music, any recorded sounds that have to be all played in on the night live during the taping of the episode. And you think about the orchestration that's required to do that, it's quite a considerable challenge to rise to. And I guess no more illustrates this better than the sandstorm, sandstorm scene in The Singing Sands, which transitions from an incredible period of quiet, highlighted by the tinkling bells of Tristram Carey's soundtrack, to the stock sounds of a horse whinnying to convey the silence of the atmosphere, before gradually you start fading up the pre-recorded track of the sandstorm, which then segues into the storm itself, where William Russell goes somewhere off screen to do his Susan ghostly voices that uh, are meant to sound like the, sand, the sands themselves doing their named singing. And all of that takes place live. As far as I can see, there was not a, a, a recording pause, an error or anything like that. It was all done in one take, which is absolutely staggering. So this is really an example of Doctor Who really being all right on the night. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, <clears throat> it's funny because when I wrote that um, article for Doctor Who magazine, I, I I contacted Brian Hodgson because I thought, uh, you know, he, he, it, it, it was a great opportunity to, to highlight his, uh, his contribution to this period of Doctor Who. He didn't actually remember much about how they did the singing sands. But um, it, it's, but, but I had that at the back of my mind when that sequence was happening and uh, then didn't refer to any of it, which um, uh, surprises me because I, I, I would always talk about Brian Hodgson as, as one of the great undersung heroes of Doctor Who. Uh, I, and I think Jeremy is absolutely right in that the soundscape and the special sounds in Doctor Who have always been very, very good. I mean, I, I love the little plonky noises of the TARDIS console and the and the scanner screen going up in, in the 80s. You know, that's all stuff that's familiar to me that you take so for granted and then you go, oh, no, that all had to be put in by Mighty Dick Mills. And, and Dick and Brian, Brian Hodgson... Uh, is, does the special sounds up until the middle of the Pertwee era and then Dick Mills takes over and they're the only two guys uh, oh does Elizabeth Parker do one episode I think she might do one story um, but uh, I, th I think other than that Dick, Dick and Dick and Brian share the special sounds credit um, you know for the whole of the series history and um, Brian did the sound of the TARDIS uh, and I also contend that much as I love Dick's Plinky Plonky Tardis and the eighties, you know, funky sounds and blah blah blah, I I, th I think Doctor Who in the Hartnell era sounds weird, and I don't think the show ever sounds quite as weird again. And that's again partially because I think we take space and time travel in our sluts in our stride slightly more as we get used to the series but if you, if you work through it in order i think this there's and it goes back to what i talked about about the environment those jungle sounds of the alien planets that 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 brian does those funny little whoops and uh, caws and uh burbles um uh, and 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 some of the space sounds that have a sort of strange whooping awe about them, and a and a slightly zany sort of um, catawall and whoop about them, uh, in, in a way that in a way that as we get more used to space travel, we don't we don't maybe maybe we just don't notice it as much. I don't know, but that, but to me, I think I. I think Doctor Who is a really weird show in the 60s uh, and particularly in the Hartnell era and more more weird than it ever is after that. And as I say, maybe that's just partially due to familiarity. And I and I mean weird as a as a compliment. Um uh, and I don't mean sort of way out and zany. I'm I mean strange and unsettling and sort of perturbing and and alien in the proper sense of the word. An alien, you know, the genius of 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 having someone like Brian doing the sounds is that even the past on terra firma on on our earth is alien and strange and and that and that comes you know and that, and that can be conveyed with the, with the brilliance of the sound so I think that's a great choice I don't know why I didn't invoke the sound myself well it's it's I, I am finding this slightly difficult as I say because I I can normally at least follow the dialogue um with with the uh with the um 
you know, with the subtitles on, and and uh, uh, you know, so that I can I can sort of talk a bit more about what people are chatting about, and indeed, you know, the the, the, the what what Jeremy described there about the sounds blending from one to the other. Well, I'm I'm afraid there was no way I could pick on that as I chatted away and got to, got bogged down in <laughs> in uh, all the stuff that I got bogged down in. Well, look, it's me talking off the top of my head and trying to be positive and trying to, you know, trying to be positive about everything, even uh, our modern day battles that we have. Um, I generally think, you know, give people a chance, assume the best in people and uh, try to persuade people of your point of view by, by, by reaching out and, you know, giving them the benefit of the doubt and um accepting that there are nuance in there's nuance in their arguments even if uh that they're saying stuff that you don't like or disagree with and certainly don't try and try and find try and find fault with somebody who you who who generally thinks the same as you but might phrase it in a different way but let look that's all that's all that's all it's, it's funny isn't it anyway it's not funny it's awful um but maybe it's just me maybe it's just because i've been spending too much time on twitter today and my time would be better spent uh mulling over positive things and having nice chats and doing this sort of thing so we are all influenced by our own environment <laughs> and mine isn't a dry dry desert or some singing sands it's it's other it's other voices that uh, that if i'm not careful will lure me to my doom so with that cautionary tale out of the way i love you all even those of you that i disagree with uh, and uh, i hope that we can continue to have civilized conversations about like, what we like and of course about what we don't like um but um uh, it's it's always very easy to talk about what we don't like so here at happy times and places i try my best even though i get sidelined sometimes to talk about what i do like and i do like doctor who and i do currently like marco polo two very good that's that so we've done as long now as uh, edge of destruction is <laughs> it's, and that's a funny old thing that i've i've done recently for my too much information podcast um and isn't it extraordinary that then the next two weeks of Doctor Who is a, is an entirely different uh, kettle of fish? Um, well, look, um, uh, I hope this has been an oasis in the desert of your day. And I shall speak to you again on the next edition, if you'll have me, of Happy Times and Places. Ta-ta. Thank you very much for listening to Happy Times and Places, which is presented by me, Toby Haydoke, and my special guest, J. Jeremy Bentham. I'm grateful to him and to the many patrons who make these podcasts possible, and they include Luke Adkins, Peter Adamson, John Arnold, Kevin Ashelford, James Bell, David Bickley, Will Brooks, Rick Byatt, Gary Byrne, Robin Bland, Alex Kafajoglu, Paul Carnahan, Andy Case, John Curley, Mark Dakin, John Ellidge, Sam Esterem, Gary Gillett, James Gould, Lisa C. Greco, David Green, Fraser Gregory, Paul Gregory, Dave Hoskin, Richie Howarth, Andrew Jordan, Ashley Knight, Clive Lewis, Guy Lambert, James Lark, Gavin McLean, David Matthewman, Jason Mayo, John McClay, and Russell McPhillips. The music is by Dave Gates, and the podcast artwork by Dylan Patterson. Well, listen, everybody, if you would like to support these podcasts and help to keep them ad-free, I mean, they will remain ad-free because I don't want them to have adverts, um, but um, that will, if if you become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydoke, uh, then you will justify my reasons for so doing. They will seem like a principled stance and, and artistic uh, decision of artistic purity rather than um, a financially irresponsible thing to do anyway patreon.com forward slash toby Haydock, you get advanced releases you get bonus material you will have heard this six months earlier than you're currently hearing it because that's how far ahead on happy times and places patrons are because they get three releases per week they're also a month or so ahead on indefinable magic 
and too much information. Patreon.com forward slash Toby Hayden. I understand, of course, that a monthly commitment is a lot to bear as the financial world crashes around us apart from uh, those who have already got lots of money. But that seems to be the way of the world. We are all in our own oasis, <laughs> apart from those who are drowning in cash. But not, so, yes, so I, I get it if you can't uh, justify a monthly commitment. But if occasionally you uh, do find yourself with a gourd full of water slash liquid assets um pour some of them into my kofi cup oh i'm liking the way this metaphor is going and and i've left the music on but i'm not retaking that i was i was pleased with the way that went so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to live with that underscore um pour that those liquid assets into my kofi cup at kofi.com forward slash toby haydoak uh, where you can just do a one-off payment of whatever you like, anytime. Uh, it's not the same monthly commitment as the Patreon one. The The advantage with Patreon, though, is that if you sign up for a year all in one go, and the lowest tier is just £3, so a year in one go uh, would be, what, uh, £36. You get 10% off that. In fact, you get 10% off any tier if you sign up a Patreon for a year in one go. So there you go, Patreon or Kofi, if you like. Um uh, but if you can do neither, and that's totally understandable, what costs you nothing is to go to your podcast provider or anywhere online and give these a five star review uh, and a, perhaps a couple of lines describing what it is you like about these and, you know, tweet them, retweet them, go into cyberspace, spread the world, spread the word on the cyber vine. And that all helps and is lovely. And now do I play now I'm going to have to play that music cue that came in because it was, it was lurking on a track here um uh, and i hadn't muted it but you don't need to know you, you heard it and you shouldn't have done but it it just shows that there i did it as live i did it i did it like they made 60s doc 2 and a music cue came in at the wrong time and i can't do anything about it now but what i can do is put it where it's supposed to go which is right about here <laughs> So as a coda to this, which remember has been an off-the-cuff stream of consciousness, not official policy, I've been thinking about the issues raised a lot. And I think it's important to call out racism, obviously, but I'm also very cautious of judging the past and zealously sending people in front of the house of unhoovian activities and condemning them on a flimsy and historically unsound premise. But mostly, I think part of the problem with what I have been trying to do here is that the person stumbling his way well-meaningly through this minefield has been me, a middle-aged white guy. Now, of course, I'm allowed an opinion and to formulate ideas and to make arguments, as is anyone on any subject. But I've been chatting to an acquaintance of mine who has more experience of the issues arising from representation or lack thereof of ethnic minorities in Doctor Who and indeed everything else. And I think that he probably has a much more interesting perspective and will be more fascinating to listen to on this subject. So a future Toby Haydock's time travels will take a break from the norm and examine this issue in a hopefully thoughtful and informed way. And unusually, I'll shut up and listen. That should be instructive. Since recording what you've just heard, though, I've been researching various actors who are used to play the Chinese characters in Marco Polo. And three of them were European Jewish actors who'd escaped the Holocaust and taken refuge in the UK, where the acting profession provided them with a safe haven and with work, where foreign was a much more general term. And so their being foreign and not speaking received pronunciation English meant that any number of non-English roles were deemed in their ballpark. And therefore, in a way that doesn't translate to us now, of course, was its own kind of progressiveness because time and context are important. What is right then might not be right now, but it was there for a good reason, and so we are judgmental of it at our peril. But anyway, for a more personal and informed perspective, there will be more of this on a future podcast, and hopefully 
less of it on all the other future podcasts because there's nothing worse than a well-meaning Guardian reader type tying himself up in knots, is there? Look, speaking personally, I will always vote for whomever seems to be the most progressive and who doesn't discriminate against people for the colour of their skin or their gender or their sexuality. But I also worry about righteousness becoming self-righteousness and that that in itself can become problematic if it is wielded unkindly and with unnecessary zeal. Now, I don't think you can scold people into changing their mind. But anyway, I've probably overthought and overworried this, but hey-ho, that's what I do. Thank you for indulging me. And uh, yeah, I think we should all be allowed to think out loud and talk about this stuff. It's important. It's only through talking about it that we reach some form of understanding. I'm getting there, but in a a very long-winded way.